Today I'm going to talk about evolution. And evolution is one of those things that people talk about but often don't understand. But nothing in biology makes sense except through understanding how evolution works. So what I'd like to try and do today is explain to you a little bit about how evolution works and get over one of the main barriers to understanding evolution. People have trouble understanding how organisms can be so complex and so how an apparently undirected process, just a random process, can generate really complex organisms. So that's what I'm going to try and do today. And the way I'm going to do it is by using an analogy. But let's start at the beginning. You know living things are amazingly complex. So this is you here. Well, maybe not the girls, but this is a boy. Um, and you can see all these green lines, that's your nervous system, that's the nerves that send information around your body. You've got one of those nervous systems, but it's composed of 100,000 million cells called neurons, here they are here, carrying the information from one part of your body to another. Each of those neurons is connected to another thousand neurons, and so you've got 100 million, what is that? a hundred million million synapses. So your nervous system is extraordinarily complex and people find it difficult to see how such a complex thing can arise through evolution. That difficulty was recognized a long time ago by um, a guy called Paley and he imagined he was walking through a field and he saw a pocket watch lying on the ground and Picking up the pocket watch, he saw that it was really complex. Here's the complex pocket watch, and uh, he said, well, you know, obviously this is a complex thing. It must have a designer. And we tend to think that when we see something complex, we tend to think that there must be a designer. So in this case, the designer is the um, watchmaker. But there's a logical problem with this idea, and that is that the watchmaker is even more complex than the watch. And if the watch is complex and needs a designer, then the watchmaker needs a designer as well. And whatever designed the watchmaker has to be even more complex than the watchmaker and needs a designer as well. And that argument goes on and on forever and it, it never gets anywhere. It's actually a ridiculous argument. So, how can we get complexity? Well, we can accept that some complex things don't actually need to be designed. Here's some snowflakes, for instance. Look how complex they are, they're beautiful. Uh, but we have a lot of problems thinking about complex living things. We have more difficulty with that. So here's some diatoms. I mean, you know, normal, kind of just looking at them, they're pretty similar to snowflakes. This, we have no problems in thinking this arise, arose naturally. Whereas this, we have a lot of problems with. What's the reason for that? Well. The reason is because we can see snowflakes form. We can watch crystals grow. Snowflakes take three hours to form. Diatoms have a three billion year old evolutionary history. So because we can't actually observe evolution happening, it becomes very difficult to understand how very complex things can arise during that process. So what I thought was maybe I can find an example of evolution that everyone can understand that happens quickly. Not over billions of years, but maybe hundreds of years instead. Because evolution is a way to make complex things. The only thing about it is it happens very slowly and it's sometimes difficult to understand. So all of these things, this um, thorny devil, flies with their beautiful eyes and this fiddlehead of a fern here, all arose through the process of evolution but they did so over billions of years. What we need to do is to find an example of evolution that happens over hundreds of years. And you can. It's called the English language. And you can show the same kinds of things that happen in evolution by looking at the way that languages change over time. And you can use that to demonstrate the principles of evolution, and these are natural selection, mutation, genetic drift, 
a thing called punctuated equilibrium and lateral gene transfer. Now, those terms may not mean very much to you at the moment, but we'll uh, persevere and I'll try and explain them. So, let's talk about mutation and natural selection. So the way that this works is that I have genes in my body that give me blue eyes, for instance, and uh, make me a certain height, uh, give me a certain amount of intelligence. They're, you know, they're bits of DNA that tell my body what to do. Sometimes when those bits of DNA are being replicated, mistakes get made in the DNA sequence. That's called a mutation. Sometimes those mutations lead to changes, and sometimes those changes are actually beneficial. That's the way evolution works. Animals with those particular mutations get to reproduce more, and that's called natural selection. So let's see how that works in language. And what we're going to do, we're going to have a look at um, a section of what's called the Canterbury Tales. Uh, you may or may not have studied this in English already, uh, but this is in the 1400s, and this is what English looked like and sounded like in the 1400s. So I'm going to pretend that I can speak um, Middle English um, and read out this uh, section, which is from the Clark's Tale, um, the Clark of Oxford. So here we go. Of studi tuki muster cure and muster hida, nocht or words bakhi mure than was nida, and that was said in forma and reverenza, and short and quick and full of he sentenza, so inja in moral virtue was his speecher, and gladly would he learn and gladly teacher. So that's English 600 years ago. And if we translate that into modern English, it sounds like this. Of study took he mo utmost care and heed, not one word spoke he more than was his need, and that was said in fullest reverence, and short and quick and full of high good sense. Pregnant of moral virtue was his speech, and gladly would he learn and gladly teach. So clearly, over the last 600 years, English has changed. It's changed in spelling, it's changed in pronunciation, how we say the words, and yet no one's been in charge of that. There's been no one saying, let's change this word, change the spelling to this, let's change how we say this word from this way, study, or, um, I don't know, I'm trying to look at examples, but I've got the wrong slide up. No one's been in charge. So how's this happened? Well, it's just exactly the same way that evolution works. Random changes to spelling and pronunciation, some of those changes were adopted. In other words, people used them. The more people use a particular spelling or a particular pronunciation, the more the old way of doing it dies out and the more the new way becomes the normal way of doing it. And we can look at individual words in that paragraph and see what's happened to them. So some words from Chaucer in the 1400s, these ones, he and word was than that, haven't changed at all over 600 600 years. The reason for this is because these are highly conserved words and if you change the pronunciation or the spelling of them they don't mean the same thing anymore. So imagine, see we've got this word he, if we say hi or who or ho it means a different word and so we can't actually change he to anything else. So all the changes, all the mutations in th those words there have been selected against, no one's adopted them, and that's the equivalent of a gene that's highly conserved, like a gene that gives us five fingers, for instance. On the other hand, over here on the right-hand side, we've got some words that have changed. So study, must, said, mur, nocht, have turned into study, most, said, more, not. So there's been minor changes, mutations in these words, and more people have used th the spellings down the bottom um, and the pronunciations down the bottom over time, so we've got mutation to the modern form, replication of the modern form because more and more people use that form, and gradually extinction of these uh, older forms of the word. And of course, there is extinction. So here's a word, soinja, which was used by Chaucer, uh, and it's now become extinct. No one uses this word anymore. It's disappeared from the English language, just like the dodo did in 1693. 
So what I want to summarize here is that English has changed over the last 600 years, but there's not been a designer. There's been no person or um, organ organization or anything like that saying, oh, this is the way English should change. It just happened naturally over time by people adopting new words and spellings and replicating those new words and spellings by using them. And that's the basis of the whole evolutionary process, mutation, selection, and replication. So how, how then do languages get more complex? Because I'm talking about complexity here. And, uh, you know, how, how do things actually get more complex? Well, one of the ways is by recombination. So genes, if you have two different genes, they can recombine, in other words, swap parts with each other, and they can make two new genes that have never been seen before. Languages do exactly the same thing. So here we've got Frankenstein's monster. Here it is here. And Frankenstein's monster, this prefix, Franken, when you think about that, it evokes, it, it, it makes you think about artificial, synthetic, monster, technology, all of the, it has all of these ideas behind it, that prefix. So we can make up new words, really simple. So here we have some, frankenfood, frankenfish, frankenscience, frankenfruit, frankenfries. Even though you've never heard those words before, you know what they mean. They mean artificial and unnatural science, or fish, or food, or um, fruit, all right? The English language works that way, and so does, so does gene language. Gene languages work by using parts of genes and recombining them with other parts and making new functions. And that increases the complexity of living things as it does increase the complexity of language. And so right now we can make up a new word. Here it is here, Franken teacher. I'm sure you've all had one. Um, and there she is. Well, um, maybe it's a he in your case. But you know what this means. Okay, now another way that languages get more complex is by stealing words from other languages. So English is one of the most adaptable and flexible languages in the world. And the reason for that is that English has grown partly due to just borrowing words from all other languages on the planet. In fact, about half of our English words have actually been stolen from other languages. So we've stolen stuff from French and German and Dutch and Italian and Arabic and Persian and everywhere. So, you know, sherbet comes from Persia. Caravan comes from Persia. Volcano, piano, umbrella come from Italian. Measles and wagon come from Dutch. So there's lots and lots of different words that we've just stolen. And that makes English more complex. There's, in the living world, the most flexible and adaptable organisms are actually bacteria. These are single-celled things that we would normally associate with disease, but most of them don't cause any disease. They just live in the ocean or in dirt or elsewhere. And they gain their adaptability by stealing genes as well. So here's a bacterium here. It's stealing a gene from this one over on the right-hand side and becoming more complex. And that's the way that bacteria evolve resistance to antibiotics, for instance. So when you get sick, you get given antibiotics. A lot of the, the bacteria that make you sick are now resistant to antibiotics. How do they do that? They just steal the antibiotic resistance gene from another bacterial cell. And so bacteria get more complex by stealing genes. Languages get more complex by stealing words. Okay. So. In evolution, when the environment stays the same for a long time, there's no need to change. So if your environment is exactly the same for 10 million years, you don't really need any evolution to adapt to new circumstances. And so looking through the fossil record, you see the same things happening over and over again, the same organisms, they, they don't look like they're changing, and then suddenly, there's a quick change to some other organism or you get a, a whole burst of mutations that lead to new forms of the old type of organism. That is normally associated with a rapid environmental change. The same thing happens in language. 
Rapid technological change generates new words. How does this happen? Well, the English language has been pretty well fixed for the last 150 years or so because of uh, dictionaries and teachers correcting people's spelling and uh, the mass media all speaking a certain form of English. However, the English language environment has changed over the last 15 years because of electronic messaging. Email, texting, Twitter, social media. These all have led to a rapid generation of new words. New words appearing really, really quickly. So uh, this sentence here, for instance, Hi mate, you okay? Sorry I forgot to call you last night. Why don't we see a film tomorrow? 15 years ago, there's virtually no one on the planet that would have understood what that meant. They would have just gone, I don't know, I've got no idea. So there's been a burst of language evolution in the last 15 years caused by a new environment. That is the new environment that's ma been made available through electronic messaging and texting. And we see similar bursts of evolution after long periods of stability in, in, the, in the fossil record. That's called punctuated equilibrium. In other words, you've got equilibrium, which means everything stays the same, and then it's punctuated, which means that you get a burst of change and then another period of equilibrium. People find it difficult to understand that in evolution, but it's clear how it happens in languages, and all you have to do is just apply that knowledge from the language to your study of living things, and you'll understand how that works. All right, so we get back to complexity. Languages have clearly become more complex over time. Once upon a time in human evolution, there were no languages. Then there were a few words. Then there were a few sentences. Then there were some more complex sentences. Then there were abstract ideas. Languages have become vastly more complex over the last, say, 100,000 years, and particularly more complex in the last 200 and even more complex in the last 20 years. There's no designer overseeing that process. That complexity has arisen naturally out of the processes of replication, mutation, selection, replication. So we get changes to the meanings and spellings of existing words. We get new words generated by recombination, by stealing from other languages, by just simple invention. And if those words are useful, they are taken up and used by speakers of the language. The more they're used, the further they get embedded um, permanently into the language. That generates complexity in the absence of design. So exactly the same thing has happened in living things. Living things have also become more complex. They've changed from single-celled organisms through to these things here, stromatolites, which are one of the first multicellular organisms, to the complex things we see today, like uh, this cuttlefish here. But those processes have had an enormous amount of time to, to happen, some 3.7 billion years. And the processes that generate complexity in living things are exactly the same as those that have generated complexity in the English language over the last 600 years. Mutation to existing genes or words, selection for advantageous changes or use of words, and replication of organisms that carry those changes. And that's all evolution is about. Now, you can demonstrate this happening in class, uh, it's a game called Chinese Whispers. And what you do, you start with a simple phrase and you whisper it from student to student. Uh, so we can't do this today, but you might like to try this sometime in class. It's a really interesting exercise. Um, so this is what I've done with my classes at university and with a number of high school groups. I've started with a sentence um, and I started with quite a complex sentence because I wanted to get use a sentence from The Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin. Uh, unfortunately, Charles Darwin writes really, really long sentences. So this is one of the shortest sentences that he wrote ever. Uh, it's still pretty long. 
and it says this, I have hitherto sometimes spoken as if variations were due to chance. And that's the opening of chapter 5 of The Origin of Species. The other good thing about this sentence is if you uh, break it down into the sounds in the sentence, which are called phonemes, and that's what we've done underneath here, it actually represents the English language pretty well in terms of all of the sounds in English. I think it's got 36 out of the 42 phonemes or something like that. So what I did here was I typed this out on a piece of paper and I gave it to the first student in a sealed envelope. They had to open the envelope, read the sentence, and then whisper it into the ear of the student next to them. Uh, and then that student had to whisper it into the next ear, etc., etc. And we did blocks of 25 students, so that's 24 replications of this sentence. And we wanted to see what came out the other end. Okay. So, what came out the other end? Well, here are some of the sentences that came out the, uh, the other end. Inhibition due to conspirance, variation in space change, I love my chung, I hum hear sometimes the ocean of tune, I have head to toe compounds and I have something to compare it with, I have head something variation, due to variation, my favourite, the man is very Asian. See, variation has become very Asian. Um, if I have to take, partake in anything, I would have to by chance. I have hyper and it is something due to variation. So there's, there's some things that you can learn about evolution from looking at this. Firstly, evolution is random. So you'll notice that none of these sentences are actually the same. They've all gone off in completely different directions. Evolution does that. You can't rewind evolution and expect the same thing to happen again. The other thing is, you'll notice that some parts of the original sentence actually survive 25 or 24 replications. So for instance, look at I here. Look, one, two, three, four, five, six of the sentences still have I in them. You'll notice that the shun sound of variation is still in there. Uh, so uh, ocean, for instance, here. Variation, 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 uh, variation. Those, those words have survived. The ch sound is often found as well. Change, chung, tune, uh, chance. So um, you can see elements of the English language, the sounds in English language, have survived. Some of them have been lost. Some of them have been altered. Some of them have, the, of them have been recombined into new words. Some have undergone mutation into new pronunciations. All of the elements of English language evolution and of biological evolution that I've been talking about, you can see in this experiment. And it's a lot of fun to do. You get to whisper in people's ears. Okay, so that's all I have to say for today. I hope uh, you've understood what I've been talking about and found it interesting. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you.